we can just get on with the show. So I'll start screen sharing. And again, if you cannot see my slide, then 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 let, let's say if you can see my slide, then wait. Right. Okay, great. So the topic of today is quantum computing and programming in two hours. Uh, and uh, the idea is here to get a bit deeper than uh, just mentioning that quantum computers are uh, are great and they are faster than normal computers, but to actually compare them to to, to how normal computers work. Uh, so, okay. So the agenda is uh, briefly this: what is quantum computing? What can it be in the future? And uh, then the emphasis is on how programming a quantum computer is different from programming normal computers or classical computers. And then we end by running a, a real quantum program on our, on our simulator. But uh, as an introduction also to see where, where this comes from. So uh, my name is Mikael Johansson and uh, I work as a quantum strategist at CSC, the IT Center for Science uh, in Finland. And uh, we are a nonprofit organization owned by the Finnish state and higher education institutions. And uh, we are actually this year turning 50. So for 50 years, we have been providing high performance computing services uh, in Finland. And uh, these days we do much, much more than that. But uh, from the point of view of today, then the HPC part is, is the relevant one. Uh, but in general, CSC provides support in all phases of research. That's our mission. So for training, planning, executing, all the way to analyzing, storing, and sharing. And uh, and uh, today's number of employees I checked it was 482. So 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 it has grown quite much over the 50 years. Uh, and the latest news that uh, can be shared here is that uh, in the HPC scene is uh, our carbon negative data center in Kajaani, where where the Lumi supercomputer will come up, but, but we will talk more about that so, uh, during this. Uh, and joining me today here is uh, Jami Rönke from IQ, IQM Quantum Computers, and uh, he will now present himself at IQM. Yes, so hello everyone. So indeed, my name is Jami Rönke, and I'm a quantum engineer from IQM Quantum Computers, and it's a bit younger company than CSC and also a private one. So, um, so at IQM, just to tell you in a few words, what we do is we, we build uh, superconducting quantum computers. So, so the technology we use is based on superconducting circuits. Um, and it's not only that we build the quantum chips, but it's actually like a full tech stack solution. So we also build the, the control electronics and the needed software. Um, and the story of IQM began in 2018 when we uh, started as a spin out from Aalto University and the Finnish Research Center, VTT. And then a year from that, uh, at the summer of 2019, we received the largest seed investment in the history of Finland, which was 11 and a half million euros. And then just to go through this short history of ours, a year from that, we actually started the second office in Munich. And then at the end of last year, we finished our series A uh, funding round where we, where we got uh, 39 million euros invested. And at the same time, VTT selected IQM to build the Finland's first quantum computer. And this was the uh, project funded by the Finnish government. And also um, earlier this year, IQM was chosen to lead this kind of quantum computer based research and development project in Germany. And as a latest uh, milestone, we have now reached the uh, over 100 employees number. And yeah, indeed, today I will be helping Mikael with the chat and questions. And at the very end, end I will show this brief notebook with the quantum program. And you can also, you'll get hands-on from your own computers. 
Yes, thank you, Yami. And uh, let's go on. So by directly asking the question and answering it, what is a quantum computer? Uh, a quantum computer is a device that directly exploits quantum mechanical phenomena to perform a calculation. And uh, here directly is the, uh, emphasized because uh, standard classical computers also deal with quantum mechanical phenomena, but there it's more of a nuisance. So in a quantum computer, one wants to use this to an advantage. That's a very brief definition of a quantum computer. Also, what is a quantum computer not? And uh, this we will talk about a bit more today. So a quantum computer is not a super fast version of a classical computer. It is really different. So it will not be a computer that just does all the same things as uh, the computers of today, just faster. So it will not just be a thousand times faster uh, laptop or, or supercomputer. And uh, this is an important point to, to, to remember. And, and, and I hope it becomes at least a bit, lit, a bit clearer today. Uh, quantum computing as an idea is 40 years old. Uh, the ideas popped up in the heads of various people at the break of 70s and 80s. Uh, and the main guys behind this uh, are usually considered to be Paul Benioff, Yuri Manin, and Richard Feynman. And uh, their realization or thought process went uh, a bit like that. Uh, as the physical world around us is inherently quantum mechanical, there is quantum mechanics at the, at the sitting at the bottom of, of everything and controlling the world around us, then simulating it, trying to model it with classical computers must be inefficient. So then the idea is, was that what if one could build something, a quantum computer instead that would be better at, at that simulating the quantum world. And as a side note, also simulating the brain with a quantum computer was an early idea. So these ideas have been, have been going on for a, for a long time and there has been developments. But, but so it's not a new idea, even if it might be now uh, quite much in the news and so forth, but the idea as such is, is 40 years old already. Uh, how is a computer, now we talk still about a normal computer, controlled? Well, in a classical computer, all the information is represented using bits. Uh, and bits are always one or zero, either one or zero. So we can have these bit strings, one, 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 zero, one, 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 zero, zero, zero. And when a computer does something, when your laptop does something, when, when the computer at the supercomputing center does something, the values change. So ones become zeros and zeros become ones. And in essence, a computer program is just a recipe for which bits to flip and when. At the, at the base of, of how a computer operates, this is all that happens. And this is how one controls them. One in the, at the right time flips ones to zeros and zeros to ones. So how could bits be improved? Well, to be and not to be, that is the answer. Uh, paraphrasing a famous, famous English poet. Uh, and that's exactly what one does in a quantum computer. So we use qubits. Uh, as mentioned, quantum computer exploits the laws of quantum mechanics and uh, that's where the power of qubits comes from because qubits can be one and zero and everything in between at the same time. So the classical bits are either zero or one, then qubits are zero and one and whatever in between, or it can be simultaneously. And uh, now we'll see a bit what this actually means in, in, in practice, because this you might have heard, uh, this is a, very standard phrase that one always brings up, but what does it actually mean? And how does that change how we have to think of things? Well, this uh, property that the qubits can be both zero and one at the same time, so it's called superposition. Uh, so one says that qubits can be in this quantum mechanical superposition of all values at the same time. Uh, and here we can now note the difference between bits and qubits already. 
And uh, the difference in, in, in their power to describe things uh, increases with increasing qubit or bit count. So if you think of bits, so two bits here, I don't know if you see the cursor or not, this always depends on the day and time of day. Uh, but uh, two bits can describe four different states. So with two bits that can be either zero or one, then we have the states zero, 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 one, one, zero, and one, one. But with two qubits, uh, we can describe all four states at the same time. So we don't need to do four different computations. We can do all four at the same time in principle, as we will see. And this difference increases with the count. So three bits, three classical bits can describe eight different states, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, and so forth. And three qubits can describe all of these eight states at the same time. If we have 20 qubits, we can describe a million states. And these different states can then, for example, represent different inputs on which our computer performs some computation. And uh, where does this come from? And then and, and if this whole session today is quantum programming in two hours, then we'll have some quantum peculiarities in, in two slides to just, uh, just give, give a bit of a background to where this comes from. Uh, when we get to something that is very, very small, then quantum effects take over uh, and common sense can be thrown out of the window. And uh, then of course, what is small? Well, molecules and atoms are small. So the figure here represents the, the scale where we are, what we are looking at. So here to the left, we have, we have uh, the C60 fullerene molecule composed of 60 carbon atoms. And the size of, size of that one compared to a small football is the same ratio as the size of the small football compared to the moon. So we are really looking at very small things. Uh, and then we get to this size scale, then the quantum mechanical effect, the wave particle duality pops up. And it means that light or photons and particles behave both like waves and individual particles at the same time. So uh, atoms and even molecules, uh, so they are not only particles, they are at the same time waves. And uh, you might have heard about the double slit experiment. Uh, this really drives home this wave particle duality. And it also demonstrates three of the quantum phenomena, at least three. Uh, that are important for, for quantum computing as such. Uh, so what we have here uh, is now a source of individual particles like photons or atoms or, or electrons or whatever. Uh, and then we have a barrier here that has two slits. There, that's where the double slit name comes from. And at the end here to the right, we have a detector screen, a measurement device of some sort that measures if we shoot out a particle from here, where does it end up at the screen? So, and if one thinks of, of standard particles, if this would now be some uh, tennis balls or whatever balls, then I can imagine that it would go either through the upper one or the lower one. And if we measure where they end up, they usually end up either as blobs here, in the upper corner or the lower corner, depending on where they went. Uh, so, it's a bit imprecise, this gun, because it's at such a small scale. So we don't really know exactly how it goes, except that it goes somewhere here. So, but what happens if we start shooting lots of particles at this screen? So we see that when it comes to the screen, then we start measuring where do they end up, then there's actually a big band here in right smack in the middle of this screen. So it seems up that the particles, even if you shoot individual particles, they end up here in the middle and not just up here and there. And that's very peculiar because a particle actually goes through both slits at the same time. But if you start measuring where it went through, if you do the measurement beforehand, so now there's a box here in the upper corner that measures 
if we went through the upper or the lower one, then this pattern disappears. And then we get the, what one would expect that the uh, particles end up either up here or down here. And uh, this happens even if you had rather large molecules. So the record for this these days is molecules of about 2000 atoms. So if I shoot, and this is, means that this is larger than, than, than the smallest proteins, which means that when one shoots molecules like this at the screen like this, then the molecule actually goes through both slits, the upper one and the lower one at the same time. And this is an example of superposition. Well, start it again. Okay, got to make. Now we get there, yes. So the particles go through both slits at the same time. And then we also see the effect of measurement. And this is also central to quantum computing. So first we can measure here where they end up. So this is what we want to measure at the end of this. And then we see that they end up here in the middle. But uh, if we start measuring before we are done, so if we now, as we can see here, put the, put the measurement to see if we went through the upper or lower one, then we can see that it immediately changes. Because now, now we have disturbed the quantum system and the quantum effect is lost. And uh, there's also in the interference of this is, is uh, included here, but we will not discuss more about this. The, uh, for today, the important things is the superposition that makes qubits be zero and one at the same time, or go through both slits at the same times, and the effect of measurement, which in effect destroys the quantum of it all. Uh, well, this uh, double slits doesn't really work as, as a technical advice for, for, for uh, qubits. So what does a qubit look like? Well, a qubit can be any system that one can put in a superposition of two states. And these two states, we have seen it already. So they are usually denoted with zero and one, but within this so-called bracket notation, just to show that it's not a number. It's not the number zero or the number one. Uh, it's uh, a state. Uh, and one example for this would be the ground and excited states of an atom, ion or molecule. So here, here we have, uh, let's say, an ion that has an electron that is circling around the nucleus as close as it can, and this has the lowest energy. And so this is the ground state. But the, what happens if we shine a laser light on this uh, is that the electron uh, uses this energy and jumps up to a higher level further away from the nucleus. And this is a different state. So this is now the state one, for example. And this requires some amount of energy. And uh, so it requires that we shine this light on the atom for some time, let's say time one, one microsecond, just to get some sort of, of a time scale on this. Another question is what happens if we just shine the light for half of this time? Well, because we are now dealing with quantum, quantum peculiarities, it turns out that the electron boat jumps and does not jump to the higher level. So by shining and using half of the energy required to turn the zero into a one, what in practice happens is that both happens. So now we have a superposition of both the zero and one state. So this is how one can prepare uh, a qubit uh, in, for example, atomic ionic uh, supercomputers, uh, quantum computers. And there's many other ways of doing this. And we will not go through the te technology more than this, but uh, normally, uh, or another very common is to use these superconducting chips. So here is a picture of the IBM, a seven qubit superconducting chip. And for that one doesn't directly shine laser light on it, but one uses these microwave input lines to manipulate the state of the, of the, of, of the qubits. But this is just to give a bit of some concreteness into what at the physical level a qubit can look like. But now let's get back to how to actually program this. And uh, now together with this superposition, 
we still need quantum entanglement to really get uh, quantum advantage out of our, our computers. Uh, so together with quantum entanglement, then qubits enable efficient solution of certain problems. And this will, and has already started to lead to a quantum revolution in computing. But before we get any results out of quantum computer, it has to be programmed. And that's, so you have to write quantum algorithms for this. And this is very different from programming classical computers. This also means that there's lots of things to be done and there's still, I would say maybe some low hanging fruits available and uh, there just needs to be more people looking into this and doing this because there is, everything has to be done from the beginning, uh, slight exaggeration, but, but uh, as we will see, it's very different. And uh, well, just a general slides on applications of quantum computing. Quantum computers can solve some problems much faster than present day supercomputers. And, and uh, standard, standard areas are machine learning, artificial intelligence, optimization problems we will see, and then design of green catalysts and chemicals, drugs, materials, whatever, in, in principle, anything that has to do with electronic structure problems. And finance modeling should uh, also be mentioned that is uh, one of the driving forces because, uh, well, there is lots of money in that industry. So, so, so any small advantage there turns out to a big bunch of a big pile of, of cash or virtual coins. But in general, quantum computing is good for finding the best answer out of several possibilities, however you want to define best. So just as a small recap, there will be a bit of recaps here and there because some concepts one cannot understand before hearing about another one. And, and uh, so there is this standard catch 22, but uh, maybe have the qubits in superpositions, all inputs can be processed in one go. While in a classical computer, the inputs have to be computed one by one. But here is an important distinction. A quantum computer only gives one answer per calculation. So even if you can compute lots of inputs, millions of inputs uh, in one calculation, you don't get out a million answers, you get out one answer. So in general, quantum computing is suitable for problem where one is interested in the best answer. And, and for example, if you have a deck of cards here, you might not want to know uh, where is the king of diamonds. And uh, in a classical computer, you would have to check, well, not all of them, but, but on average half of them uh, before you know that. But in a quantum computer, you can just ask at the same time, where is it? And you get the answer. Well, the fourth card is the king of diamonds. Uh, and you just need to do one calculation. But after that, you have no idea what the other cards are. So if you actually want to know what the other cards are, then you have to do a classical computation anyway and check them all one by one. But if you have a problem of the type where you just want the best answer, then, then quantum computers are excellent. Another classical example is a traveling salesman problem of finding an optimal route that connects some set of points. And uh, this is a problem that really, well, uh, it grows factorially as, as shown here. So if you just want to test all of the options, then it, it becomes impossible. So if you have four cities, then you have six options to connect them. If you have 10 cities, then you have 300,000 options. If you have 20 cities or points, then it just becomes already ridiculous. But this is also one of those problems where only the optimal answer is of interest. You don't want to know what is the 740th shortest route. You want to know what is the shortest route. Just one answer is good enough. And almost optimal is usually good enough as well. Uh, and just to note that, of course, classical algorithms have been developed that don't go through all the routes because otherwise it would be impossible. So there's many, many ways of doing this in a clever way without using just a brute force attack. But just as an example of, of, of how, what, what type of problems quantum computing is good for. Okay, and then we should mention threats. And uh, the big threat that uh, you probably have heard of is breaking cryptography, breaking bad cryptography. Uh, and bad is here, here defined as something that is not quantum resistant. That means a quantum computer could crack it. And uh, 
One of the most famous algorithms from 1996 already is uh, Shor's algorithm on factorizing integers into prime number constituents. And uh, this is a normally for standard supercomputers a very difficult task if you have large enough numbers. Uh, so much of presently used public key cryptography, uh, all the cryptography that you use to talk to your bank or, or our, uh, so forth in everyday life is based on this, that, that doing this computation is very difficult for a standard computer, but it's not difficult for a quantum computer. Uh, and even if quantum computers uh, that exist today cannot track this, uh, when they become big enough, they can do it. And then one has to ask myself the question that when do secrets expire? There's many secrets that you would not want people to know in let's say 20 years. There's some secrets that should be secret forever. There are some secrets that, that need to be secret for 50 years. So there is actually a need to act now. Uh, one example is of course uh, state discussions and so forth, but the uh, things that concern all of us is uh, medical data and so forth. Do you want people to have access to that? Uh, New, new, new encryption standards are coming next year, plan to be coming, and then uh, we have to prepare for this. And just to show what this is all about, so, so, so the computation of, uh, so this RSA 2048 algorithm, for example, that, that's a classical uh, standard algorithm for, for encrypt, encrypting things, uh, lots of things, is based on, on the calculation of, of multiplying two prime numbers that are about 300 digits long. And a standard computer does this calculation in a second, or well, less than a second, immediately. Uh, but now going back from this one, this is now 600 digit long number, and figuring out what prime numbers led up to this number. Uh, for a classical computer, that's impossible. It, it takes thousands, thousands of times the age of the universe to, to just go back. But a quantum computer can quickly give, no, it's these. And the best thing about this is that one can easily check was the quantum computer right, because I said, this calculation is very easy. So this is something that has to be taken into account. And, and in a way, this is also an optimization problem. So what are the best numbers that lead to this number? Well, the best and only answer is these two prime. OK, and then a bit of connection to high performance quantum computing or high performance computing. So we now see that only certain types of problems or sub problems can be solved faster on a quantum computer. We should note faster because quantum computers are good and complete in the way that they, in principle, you can calculate everything in a quantum computer. It's just that many things will be much slower than doing it on, on a normal computer. Uh, but the real world problems combine different types of algorithms and, and then some run better on quantum hardware and some on classical computers. And uh, usually parts of whatever calculation, uh, especially in scientific modeling or, or whatever financial modeling, uh, weather modeling, uh, parts of that calculation can run more efficiently on a GPU. And that's where the concept of hybrid HPC plus QC algorithms comes from. So it's a bit like comparing the GPUs and QPUs, or if I can compare them, uh, graphical processing units are, are now taking over lots of the calculations that are being done in the world. But it's also, that, that's just a very quick comparison because GPUs still do exactly the same algorithms as CPUs that are standard computers, but, but, but uh, a QPU has to do something completely different. But uh, one can without doubt say that supercomputers love quantum computers and quantum computers will merge with supercomputers. So they will not replace them because they cannot do everything that a supercomputer can do or even a standard laptop, but they can do some things better. And here, just to mention the uh, Lumi supercomputer that starts this year in, in Finland, and uh, it will be faster than the current fastest computer in the world. So it will have 550 petaflops of computing power that compares to one and a half million laptops. And, and then this is an ideal platform for hybrid uh, 
high performance computing and quantum computing because we can really use the best that and fastest that is available in classical computing and combine that with quantum computing. And we can also mention if there is, uh, as there is members of, of uh, industry in the audience that 20% of these resources are, are allocated for small and medium sized enterprises uh, around Europe. So this will be a pan-European supercomputer, even if it's located in Finland. Okay, now after a bit of general discussion, we come a bit closer to the actual stuff. And one concept that is crucial for quantum computing is the difference between irreversible and reversible computing. Classical computer programs are nor normally irreversible. And this means that the input cannot be inferred from the output. So information is lost during computing. Uh, in other words, let's use an example. If we add two numbers A plus B and we get the answer C, then from this answer, if we have, let's say, A is seven and B is three, then the sum is of course 10. But from the answer, we cannot go back we don't know what A and B was anymore. So we have lost information during, during the calculation. So this calculation is irreversible. But this calculation could be done in a reversible way, but just a bit more effort. So instead of just computing C equals A plus, A plus B, we also compute D A equals A minus B. And then we still get our answer, the one that we want, C equals 10. So the calculation is still as useful as before. But then we also get this extra information, D equals four. And now with these, we can go back and deduce what was the input. So this is an example of a reversible computer program. Uh, classical computing, as said, so uses irreversible operations. Also on the basic information units, the bits. And as an example here, we have OR. Uh, the classical logical operator or. So uh, it takes input X and Y, and if either of them is one, then the answer is one. So if X or Y is true, then the result is true. But now, of course, if we have the answer one, we don't anymore know what the input was because there's three different options. Uh, but some operations are reversible also in classical computing, for example, not, so not zero is one and not one is zero. So here we always know there's no information loss. So we always know what the input was from the output. But quantum operations are all reversible. They have to be reversible. You cannot do any computation in a, with a quantum computer that is not reversible, except the complete co calculation when you then get the result at the end. And this, uh, without going into details, just follows from the rules of quantum mechanics. Uh, and using only reversible operations really requires rethinking of algorithms. Uh, and just as a side note, it is also possible to do classical computation with only reversible gates. So in that, that way, it's not, it's not a completely new concept and there has been work on reversible classical computation, but just because it's not necessary, not too much effort has been put into that. But as a side note, that would use much less energy. Uh, and then we come to the bit qubit manipulation. So a classical computer, as mentioned, simply flips the states of the bits from zero to one to zero to one and so forth. But the quantum bits are much more versatile as they can be something in between zero and one. And in general, we mark this as some coefficient alpha uh, times zero plus beta times one. And this alpha and beta are complex numbers. So they have a real and imaginary part, uh, but uh, they can be rep represented as points on a sphere. So this state of the qubit alpha zero plus beta one can be seen as a point on a so-called Bloch sphere. So anywhere on the surface of this one uh, or, or the value of a qubit can be anything on this surface. While in a classical computer, it can only be up here at zero or down here at one, zero one, but the qubit can be anywhere on the surface of this sphere. And uh, qubits can do this. And to actually get some advantage out of a quantum computer, you have to do this. You have to use this flexibility. 
So this can be compared to just, just uh, the globe of the Earth where the North Pole is zero and uh, the South Pole is one. And uh, let's see now, I need to. So prepared small video where, where, where we can see how to manipulate qubits. So we can either put the qubit on the North Pole and then we see that, well, this would correspond to the state zero, like a normal bit. And in classical computing, the only thing we could do is to go all the way to the South Pole and change the state to one. But in a quantum computer, we can also go, for example, to the equator. And this would be a 50-50 superposition of both zero and one. But we can also have other options. We can have anything as mentioned on the sphere. So we can go to, well, CSC. So even if we haven't been much in the office these days, or we can go to the other side of the of the world completely. And all of these manipulations, also these very small changes of just moving the qubit a bit around uh, on, the, on the surface is needed and required to get quantum advantage, to get some useful things out of a quantum computer. Oops. This maintaining this superposition is central to quantum computer. Computing. Because when the superposition is lost, the calculation is over. We can compare this a bit to the double slit experiment. So if we, if we measure, measure during the calculation or the event, then it's done. Then the quantum part disappears. So superposition is lost if one measures the state of the qubit as well. So here we have famous Schrodinger's cat. So uh, when he's in the box, we don't know if he's awake or asleep, so we have to look in there and okay, the cat is awake. Uh, but uh, when we measure a qubit, so it will always give zero or one as an answer, even when the qubit first was in a superposition of zero or one. So we don't get an answer at 0 0.7, for example. We all get, always get zero or one. And after we have measured it, there's no way of going back. So the value sticks after that the qubit doesn't change anymore. This is tricky. So in a way, like I said, that the values of the qubit can only be printed out in the program once and at the end. If we try to print out some intermediate variables or values, then no, in quantum computing that just doesn't work. So even if several inputs can be processed at once, only one answer will come out from it. So if we have an input here, state of alpha zero plus beta one, I put it into our QPU. Uh, it does some function on this. Uh, and then we measure the result. Then we will get either the value for F zero or F one. This might become clearer with an example. And uh, in general, the answer depends on these amplitudes, alpha and beta. And uh, it just means that the alpha squared plus beta squared needs to be 100%. So there is some probability that you get F0 and some probability that you get F1. And here's good to note that the quantum computer is not deterministic. In general, when you run a quantum program, you will get different answers for the same input. And this is a feature, it's not a bug. It's also a problem sometimes, sometimes it becomes a bug just because of noise and so forth. But but, but a quantum computer is supposed to be probabilistic. And this is also a very big difference to classical computing where you are used to that the computer always gives the same correct answer if you run the same calculation. But quantum computers don't do this. Uh, you get either F0 or F1. And you can and should try to tune the probability of getting one answer or the other, but you can never get it to be completely deterministic. So, if you look at it in another way, uh, in a classical computer, if we now have two bits, then we had the four states, 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, and 1, 1. And then we can feed these four one by one for calculation into a function. And then we get the answer here, F0, 0, F0, 1, well, whatever it is. But in a quantum computer, what we do is that we prepare a superposition of all of these uh, with coefficients alpha, beta, gamma, delta, and here, uh, I've just marked them with 
with this some sort of a wave that shows shows the magnitude of alpha, beta, gamma, and delta. So uh, in the beginning, we should have an equal superposition. That is what this is supposed to say. So we put in, and then we have one calculation and put it into a quantum function. And uh, out we get uh, F0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1, but with different probabilities. And uh, now we can see here that the beta answer, the function zero one, the probability of that one has somehow increased much more than the others. And this is actually what a quantum computer should, a quantum program needs to do. So it, it's not enough that it calculates what we want. It also at the same time has to massage or manipulate the probability of the right answer coming out. And this is an added step and it's, uh, it's an added complexity. But uh, this means that in the end, Let's say now that this is a good quantum algorithm that actually works. So, so, so the correct answer, the best answer we want is that zero one, whatever that represents was the correct and best uh, option. And then we need to massage the probability amplitude so that most of the time, the quantum computer gives this as an answer. But it will all, all also sometimes give the others as answers. So it's never enough to run a quantum algorithm once because you never know if it was actually correct or not. And that is by design. Okay, we should mention noise. Uh, qubits are very delicate. So their states change due to outside influence. Uh, and that's called noise. It can be lots of different things. Temperature, for, exa for example. Uh, and if they are disturbed, then the superposition is lost. And that means that you cannot do the calculation anymore. That's it. And uh, it also means that, well, a quantum computer will still continue to attempt to calculate something, but you will just get a flat line of noise or even completely wrong answers out of it. And you, you don't really know this. So you also have to look out for this. Uh, and this affects the way algorithms have to be constructed because one has to get them to be, to be noise resilient, so to say. Uh, and again, the difference to classical computing is that in classical computing, if you have an inefficient program, it just runs for longer than necessary. So it might take a week to run instead of a, an hour if you just program it badly. But in quantum computing, if it runs for longer, then the errors grow. So the longer a quantum algorithm runs, uh, the longer time it needs to complete, the larger the errors. So it just, it, it's not just that it takes longer to get your answer, you actually get wrong answers just if you have a, a bad algorithm. Okay, there's many different types of quantum computers uh, and uh, depending on what type they are, they are programmed in different ways. Uh, the main classes can be considered to be quantum annealers and quantum simulators. That's uh, two classes that are not completely general quantum computers, but they do some things uh, exploiting quantum mechanical phenomena that uh, can speed up their calculation. Uh, but then there are these general types of quantum computers and uh, there's two main classes of this and it's continuous variable quantum computers that don't directly use qubits. Uh, so they, instead of just two states zero and one, they have a continuous set of states. Uh, but the one that is developed most intensively uh, and most broadly is the so-called gate-based quantum computers that use qubits and are completely general, Turing complete, and 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 uh, that is the ones that we are going to look at today. But just as a reminder that this is not the only way to program quantum computers, but but um, it will still give some sort of an idea of how to do it. Uh, okay, let's see now a bit of how to actually program a quantum computer. We're really at at detail and, and and again there's a bit of mathematics here but it's not that that much but if you have not done linear algebra before then then, then it, it might be uh, a bit unclear in the beginning but it will hopefully anyway give you some idea so when we program using quantum gates 
and then these operations are represented using linear algebra. So states, that is the qubit, so they are vectors. So the zero state is a vector one, zero, and the one state is the vector zero, one. And operators, the gate operations themselves, so they are matrices. Uh, so for example, the not operation looks like a two by two matrix like this. And now applying a quantum operation on a state just means performing the linear algebra uh, of the matrix times the vector. And as an example, we have here not zero, and we know that that should then the answer should be one because not zero is one. In classical computing, and it is also that in, in quantum computing. So what we do is just a, this is just a quick recap of, of linear algebra. So we multiply uh, row wise and column wise. So it's zero times one is here zero, and then one times zero is zero. So that's the result here uh, in the first row, uh, like this. Uh, and then similarly for the bottom row. And uh, But uh, what we see here is that not zero equals one. And it just comes from this rather simple linear algebra. Okay, quantum algorithms are often shown as circuit diagrams and we will see more of them today and you will also make one yourself at the end. Uh, and why can I do use symbols or names? Most of them have names, but some have also uh, symbols. So, so X, the not operator can either be like this plus sign within, within a circle or then just the letter X. And then a circuit diagram for this that we did in the last slide, not zero would look like we start from the state zero and then the qubit evolves in time and comes oops, to the not operator here and then goes and what has happened is that we now have the state one. So this would be a very simple circuit diagram uh, and a very simple quantum algorithm as well. Okay, and another gate, we will go through three gates in this and, and, and uh, the arch quantum operator is the Hadamard gate. And just like the not operator, it's also just a two by two matrix looks like this. Uh, and then it has a factor in front here. But what this Hadamard gate is that this one actually transforms a qubit from a specific state to a superposition of two states. And this is really central to quantum computing. So let's have a look at this. So if we actually do now, there's my cursor it's here, Hadamard on zero. And we do the mathematics here again, row by column. What we see is that we get these results, which means that we have from starting from zero, we have now state zero plus state one. And then this is divided by the square root of two. And this is just to get the probabilities to add up to 100%. But the main, main point here is that by applying this gate, that looks this simple, doing this operation, we have now transformed our qubit from state one to a superposition of zero plus one. And this is really central. This is of course something that you, uh, this operation does not exist in classical computing because you cannot manipulate bits like this. You cannot make a bit be zero and one at the same time. But with this simple operation, you can do it for qubits. Okay. Uh, if you have more qubits, then it becomes uh, longer expressions, but the uh, logic is the same. So if we have two qubits, the four different states are just uh, vectors again, but they are just longer vectors now. And then operators on two qubits, so they are then by necessity four by four matrices. And uh, I want to show you another central gate uh, in quantum computing, and that's the controlled not C not. And a controlled gate uses one of the qubits to control the operation. That's where the name comes from. And the other qubit is the target. And in, pre, uh, in, in essence, if control equals zero, then do nothing. That's the idea. So 
the control not performs not the not operation on the target qubit if the control qubit equals one. And the matrix for this is again very simple. So we have just ones and zeros, and here we have them off diagonal. And uh, as the recording still is going fine, so you can look at this later at your leisure. But uh, just as an example, C not on the state one zero. Well, we can already see what this should happen. So the control bit here is now one, which means that we actually should do something. And the target qubit is zero. And what we should do is the not operation. So we know that the answer should be one, one. And if we do the simple linear algebra here, we see that it actually pops out naturally exactly from this. And this one is actually analogous to the classical exclusive or uh, gate or operator of classical Boolean sets. So if you compare the two here now, C not uh, versus uh, exclusive or, so we have the uh, C not here on this side. So we have input X and Y qubits here. Then this is what we get as output. Uh, the X or classical gate looks very much the same, except that now we have, well, we have the bit values zero and one instead of the states. So, so far, everything looks quite classical here. But uh, what if we now have the input states in superposition? Well, but we have something else than the pure states zero and one as input. Also, the quantum gates operate in a much more complex manner. Uh, so if you have coefficients alpha and beta, then they take part in the computation here. So it becomes, the result is much more complex. Not, maybe not much more, but it is more complex than what you can do with bits. Uh, and uh, I just want to show this one still uh, in at the basic calculation level. So what happens if we would have an algorithm that looks like this? Here's the circuit. So we have two qubits that we start with state zero. And then we do first an Hadamard gate on the first qubit. And after that, we do this C not the control not operation. And what we see here is that now the control qubit here will not be zero or one. It will be both zero and one. And what happens if the control qubit is both zero and one at the same time? So after the Hadamard gate, we have this superposition. So now we don't have a qubit zero anymore. The qubit is in the state zero plus one. Then the state of both qubits here is, well, it's at zero plus one, and then the other qubit is still zero. So we can write it like this. And now if you just do the C not, operation, because now we are supposed to do the C not on this state that we have here. Uh, so we can just rewrite it like this. And uh, what we see is that the result is that we get the state zero, zero plus the state one, one. And again, divided by the square root of root two, just to give the uh, probabilities 100%. But what does this mean? Well. This is actually now what is called a Bell state or an EPR pair from Einstein, Podolsky, and Rosen. Uh, and uh, here enters entanglement. Because if you now think of what does this mean, we now have an equal superposition of two out of four possible two qubit states. Because after this, our two qubit system is in a superposition of zero, zero and one, one. But we, for example, have no probability of finding the zero, one or one, zero state. So what this means is that if qubit A is zero, also qubit B is zero. And if qubit A is one, then also qubit B is one. But before measuring, we don't know which, which one they are. Are they zero or one? But we do know that they are equal. And this is the entanglement, or as Einstein so famously put it, the spooky action at the distance. Because now after doing this, it doesn't matter if qubit one goes to the moon and qubit B 
goes to the other side of the universe. At the moment, when you measure qubit A, the value of qubit B is immediately in zero time uh, determined. So just by doing something to qubit A, you immediately affect something on qubit B, no matter how far away it is. And this is, well, Einstein thought it was spooky. And uh, if this now becomes a bit weird, then you are, I said, in good company. And this is, um, I like this, this is a letter that Einstein wrote in 1952. And uh, here he just compares quantum mechanics to, uh, and I can just read this quote here. This theory reminds all of the system of delusion of an exceedingly intelligent paranoiac concocted of incoherent elements of thought. But um, so quantum mechanics is not, it do, doesn't necessarily make sense, but uh, it works. That's the main point. So we don't need to know why it works, but we need to know how to exploit it. And in the, in the uh, setting of quantum computing, this is uh, central. So we just need to know how to program them. We don't need to know why the quantum computers work. Uh, and here's just a table of different quantum logic gates. So we went through a couple that one can use for programming, but um, the quantum logic gates are, it's a set and we remember that they have to be reversible logic operations that one uses for programming a quantum computer. And uh, here's just a list from Wikipedia, but there are many more of these gates and uh, there's infinitely many more because one can adjust the, these parameters continuously in, in, in some of the gates. But uh, the main point to remember here is that we don't need all of these gates and most of these gates are not implemented on real quantum computers uh, anyway. So real quantum computers have different gates and they might be conceptually more complex because as, as we see here, so, so the operations here, the matrices, they are not very, well, they are not very complex, but uh, uh, the, so they have, are usually zeros or ones and sometimes some exponents there and imaginary numbers. But um, on a real, real quantum computer, the physical gate operations have often much more complex matrices, but that's just because they are then, when you engineer and build it, it might be easier to, to implement. But, but uh, it doesn't matter because they are all, all Turing complete and you can translate between the gates. So. That's the important one. And uh, what we do then is that we combine these basic operations into algorithms. And for now, quantum program in general means writing rather low level code. So a quantum algorithm is shown here as a circuit diagram and we build them up from these basic gate operations. And in the future and in the making is now of course also libraries ready-made libraries of these quantum algorithms and the more advanced compilers. And uh, well, Fortran will be around forever. Uh, but uh, for the moment, if one really wants to come up with something completely new, then one needs to compile at, at the gate level or program at the gate level. But uh, all of these higher level languages need to be developed so that they are ready when the big quantum computers and QPUs come. And uh, before the break, I think it's good to bring up Ada Lovelace. And uh, because uh, as mentioned, so it's important that we write these algorithms so that they are ready, ready so that we can actually put the quantum computers into good use immediately. And uh, the first computer algorithms were also written before the hardware. And and then uh, here's just, uh, the Bernoulli algorithm by Ada Lovelace was, was published in 1843. And this is really uh, a real computer program with loops and stuff uh, implemented. And it was programmed for Charles Babbage's analytical engine that has not been built to date. Uh, but of course, other computers have been built and, and then this al algorithm has been run and it works. Then one fixes a couple of bugs, but uh, the main point here is that that one can program before one has the computer. 
that one has done that uh, before. And for quantum computers, it's it's equally important. And I, I th think that we have a five minute break here now uh, and, and then think about this for a while. And, and then, then we'll come back to a few questions from the, from the audience. See you in five minutes. Okay, let's uh, continue. And, and, and uh, now Yami has prepared for some some questions, so let's uh, share the correct screen for that one. Again, if you see something useful, then you can wave. Great. Uh, so let's see. Oh, uh, and Yami, jump in with comments. So, first question: If one chemical compound that has one million possibilities of having different energy states but only one possibility in lowest energy state, then can the qubit give the result for that lowest energy state? Um, well, yeah, that's a good question. In general, I guess that uh, relates to, to, to calculating the electronic structure of, of materials and, and in principle, yes, but we are not there yet. And, and, and efficient algorithms for this are still being developed. So, but there is a, there is a like rather large community developing quantum chemical and material science algorithms. And there is, for example, this open fermion project that you can look into and, and, and but uh, much of this is uh, actually translating standard algorithms, classical algorithms so that they work on quantum computers, but uh, there's quite much that could be done to to, to exploit quantum computing directly and, and simulating the, the quantum world directly as the original idea 40 years ago. So, so, so we are not really there yet. And, and then much of that is due to technical reasons. And, uh, but maybe Yami, do you have some more yeah. comments on this? Uh, yeah. Yeah, so yeah, exactly. I think this is a good question because this is one of the big promises that quantum computers would be good at uh, simulating chemistry. And also this one is optimization problem so that you need to find the lowest energy state. Uh, and yeah, there are algorithms for this, like the uh, quantum eigensolver algorithm, which is planned to do this, this thing. But indeed, the, uh, the hardware still has to catch, catch up to be able to do this stuff. But in theory, it is it is like a really promising thing for quantum computers to do, simulate these molecules and especially find their energy states, lowest energy states. Yes. Uh, question two, how does quantum computing deal with the fact that the qubits live for a short period of time? In other words, how are algorithms modified to take into account gate time? Well. Because the short answer is that one needs to do short enough algorithms. Uh, mm. A more general one is that error correction schemes uh, are really being put into place. But uh, but but the reality is that, that that they cannot still be too long. But 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 there is lots of lots of efforts being done into taking care of error correction because that is something that one will have to do for for a long time. Yami probably has more. Yeah, indeed, that is the. Uh, the grand plan is that you would have like many qubits to which you encode uh, basically a state of a single logical qubit. And then you can run this kind of exactly error correcting algorithm, which will notice if one of these qubits fl say flips its uh, position from to zero to one due to some mistake. And then you can detect this and then you can correct for it. Basically based on like majority voting, you have five qubits and then one of them is showing zero rest of them is showing one then you can correct for this mistake so this is this is the <clears throat> one way around it but it's also really really tricky to have so many qubits that these kind of techniques would require so these day pe these days people try to uh, mitigate the errors in all kinds of ways like shielding the qubits as well as possible and uh, optimizing everything in all kinds of ways protecting them from the noise 
Yes. Okay. Yes. So we were left in the good hands of Aid Lovelace and that which is analytical engine. And uh, here's just a quick overview of the different levels of quantum programming that we are at now. And, and, and from the highest level, there we would have ready-made libraries of common mathematical subroutines. And these one could then call just from standard programming languages. Uh, and there is already efforts towards this. Uh, and and, and uh, this is for general computing, uh, this is the way to go. We need to get uh, our normal programs to run and, and utilize utilize quantum quantum hardware, uh, but uh, we are not really there let, yet. Uh, so one level lower would be these um, uh, higher level languages or software development bits for quantum uh, quantum programming, and uh, at this level one would devise new quantum algorithms and apply existing algorithms to new problems. And th these are both equally important and there's probably much more to be done within the applying existing algorithms to new problems. And uh, here's just some example names of what is going around already now. Uh, and then we have level one that we went through now is this circuit level assembly where we build up the, the circuits. And uh, this is the level where, where the real breakthroughs can come in, in the way that one comes up with completely new, new, new quantum primitives that then can be used for, for a wide variety of problems. But uh, for now, somewhere in between one and two is where, where most of the effort is being done or where mo most of, uh, of course, there's lots of efforts also in developing higher level ones, but, but, but where, where there is still Lots of ground to cover, and uh, I would say that the main, main easy fruits, low-hanging fruits, delicious fruits would be in, in in applying what already exists, but to new problems. So one has to find what in existing existing uh, computers programs could be transferred to a quantum. Uh, quantum processing unit and identifying those things and how to rethink problems also uh, so that one from the beginning would 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 take into account the possibilities of quantum uh, then there's of course also level zero but uh, where we come into hardware level coding and that would be uh, really going into the exact pulses and the implementations of gates on, on quantum hardware. But uh, that is uh, not something that 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 uh, general programmer would ever do. And that is that is very, uh, very hardware specific and also uh, well, very complicated. So 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 one, one, one can write PhD thesis of how to how to perform one operation at the hardware level. But uh, that's also not necessary, luckily. But there are challenges in quantum programming. And the first one is really problem identification because we cannot do everything on a quantum computer. It is rather limited, uh, the problem set that can be solved, but that limited problem set then exists as a sub problem in, in, in many other modeling problems. So what exactly can and should quantum computers compute? And then after identifying that, then one has to extract the advantage. So how, how should one exploit this uh, options of superposition and entanglement and, and the phases? We haven't talked about them. Uh, and then we have to work around limitations. And the Biggest limitation right now is noise. So, so, so the quantum computer is easily disturbed and starts spitting out random values. And then as a challenge can also be considered this hybrid HPC plus quantum computing. Uh, we really need to get the best of both worlds because uh, in the future forever, 
uh, one needs to do some parts on classical hardware and some part on quantum hardware. And then the big challenge is that we have a really different programming paradigm. So all operations have to be reversible as discussed. And then we have only one measurement at the end, so we cannot print out stuff in the middle of the algorithm. It is probabilistic and not deterministic. Uh, and then just to throw out the concept there, but we also have to do uncomputing. Uh, we will not go into that now, but there is lots of these extra complications that you no, don't need to uh, ever think of when we are doing just a quick classical Python program or whatever. But then again, programming challenges have been around forever since computers. So this is now 75 years since ENIAC was publicly announced, the electronic numerical integrator and computer. And, and, and this is just, just cut out something from the manual. So there is the example that do not open this if use cabinet because uh, in, uh, the person may be burned by flying pieces of molten fuse bio. So in a way now as the classical programming languages and software development kits have become so, so developed that you these days don't even have to write a line of code. You can use a, use a graphical user interface to program your own games, then people might have become a bit spoiled but uh, just as it was worth using three weeks to set up the ENIAC to do a calculation, just because it did things 5,000 times faster than anyone could do, then you went through the trouble. In the same way, uh, it is worth going through the trouble for quantum computers, because after you do that, even if it is inconvenient and troublesome, then you really get or can get uh, solutions to problems that you could never imagine getting uh, with classical computers. So where are we at the moment? Well, 2019 was the famous year when Google demonstrated so-called quantum supremacy, which means that a quantum computer did something faster than a classical computer. Okay for doing something useful faster, that's usually called quantum advantage, uh, you need at least hundreds of high quality qubits. Uh, and as a side note, so quantum advantage could, instead of faster also mean that we just do things more energy efficiently. But uh, today the largest qubit count of this uh, gate-based uh, general purpose quantum computers is 65 and they are rather noisy. But uh, progress is projected to be very rapid. So here's the roadmap of IBM. So we are now here at 65 qubits. Uh, already this year, uh, that should be doubled and uh, IBM predicts to have a thousand qubits available in 2023. So we are really growing very quickly here, at least according to the roadmap. But uh, hmm, now I press something. Yes. So development is rapid, and it has kept up. And uh, the Finnish connection here is that uh, right now the first Finnish quantum computer is also being built, and it's being built together by VTT. The, and the IQM. And uh, so we are doing our part as well. And here's just a roadmap of the Finnish quantum computing infrastructure. So, and uh, this is just to show that, that uh, quantum computing is considered important uh, and central over here as well. So it's on the Quantum computing is on the Finnish National Research Infrastructure Roadmap since last year. And uh, our mission is to provide state-of-the-art quantum computing services, both computing and training and so forth. And uh, so it's being built up here as well. And next year, hopefully we will have uh, our hybrid HPC plus QC platform open 
uh, for business. And uh, part of this is uh, connected to the Lumi supercomputer, uh, where the vision of the Lumi Q uh, part would be that we, we have the fastest supercomputer in Europe connected to a bunch of different quantum computers around the world. And so we would have everything in, in one package. Uh, Lumi will be the world leading artificial intelligence platform uh, and combining that with quantum computing. Uh, I would say that's an ideal package because artificial, artificial intelligence and machine learning can do a lot to improve quantum computing and quantum computing can do a lot uh, for improving well general modeling and so forth. But this is coming. And then at some point in the future, when the quantum internet or parts of it is in place, then, then, then combining quantum computers is, uh, is an idea that is being, being considered globally and because that would, would really increase the power of them uh, very much. Uh, if you now compare to how it was uh, with classical computers, so now we have our first commercial quantum computers available also via the cloud. So IQM is building quantum computers, IBM and D-Way are offering uh, their stuff on, on, on the cloud. Uh, and in a way, quantum computing is now the stage where microprocessors were 50 years ago. Because in 1971, Intel released the first commercial microchip, microprocessor. Uh, that one had 2000 transistors. Now in 50 years, the largest chip today has 2.6 trillion transistors. That's uh, nine orders of magnitude more. Uh, that, that is a huge leap in technology. And this is also something to consider. So even if we are very much in the beginning now with quantum computers, uh, it's a technology that has the uh, capability to grow just like standard classical chips. So when CSC celebrates 100 years, let's see where we are. Uh, but uh, also it's good to know that, that, that one never really knows where we are going. So, so, so the Intel 4004 processor was, for example, used in controlling the first pinball machine that was, well, controlled by a microchip. Uh, and that's probably something that, that, that the engineers at Intel did not foresee as the first application of, of their chip, but, but, but just to see, see that, or that, that shows just that unexpected things happen. But the progress in technology is fast and has historically been, no matter what the field is. But especially in, in latest years, of course, we know that technology is really rising. And just a short mention about the role of CSC. So right now there is plenty of interest towards quantum computing worldwide and also in Finland. And uh, we see our role as important in catalyzing the uptake uh, and pushing Europe and Finland to the forefront of quantum technology, because it is a field where, where, where it is important to have know-how. And part of this is to really provide a working and user-friendly quantum computing ecosystem. So, a summary so far, quantum computing is coming and it can revolutionize computing in due time. It's not there yet, but uh, when it comes, then, then all these different fields of applications and especially the last one, something no one ever thought of will be important. And another point about quantum technology is that it's very modular. So it's also for businesses and, and, and in general basic research is a true opportunity for high tech and top science, because I can concentrate on small fields still. There is lots of small subfields and, and, and things to do that, that, that because it, it is opening up so many possibilities that uh, there's plenty for the taking. There's also an exponentially growing job market within this. So it is important that there is a workforce that can do this. And one thing to, 
that really, really also drives home the point of how powerful quantum computers can be in the future is that each additional qubit, if it's high quality, uh, doubles the power of a QPU. So when you go from a 100 qubit machine to a 101 qubit machine, it's twice as efficient. When you go from a 1000 qubit machine to a 1001 qubit machine, it's still twice as efficient. While in classical computing, of course, if you go from 1000 to 1001, it's uh, an insignificant change in the, in the uh, power, uh, computing power. But for a quantum computer, in principle, each qubit adds plenty. So it's crucial to build up the competence in, in this field early enough to really take advantage of, of the technology when it comes. So both hardware and software should be ready. And especially also for the non-expert end user, because there is so much real world problems that can be solved with enough computing power that we need to prepare for this. Uh, okay, so first steps to programming a quantum computer. So as mentioned, quantum computer platforms are available in the cloud. IBM Q experience, D-Wave Leap, Strangeworks, uh, and also simulators or emulators are available. And uh, the one that uh, CSC has acquired is the Atos Quantum Learning Machine, QLM. It's a highly efficient simulator and features advanced noise models and optimization procedures and so forth. Uh, but of course, there's also many other emulators. And emulators actually have advantages over real, real quantum computers. Uh, so one can test the behavior of quantum algorithms while developing them and optimizing the code. So one can take into account effects of noise and hardware details, qubit connectivity and so forth in an emulator simulator. And another thing is that one can follow the states of the qubits during the calculation. Because this was not possible and is not possible to, with real quantum computers. You cannot debug your code because you can only measure once. So you cannot put in print statements. Anyone who has done some programming knows that printing out variables in the middle of the calculation is, is very useful for knowing where, where things start going wrong. But in a real quantum computer, you cannot do that. In an emulator, you can. And another point that is also important is that one can program without having physical access or access, cloud access to the computer. And this should not be underestimated. And just as an example, so Microsoft's first product was written on an emulator in 1975. So Paul Allen wrote an emulator for the Altair machine and Bill Gates wrote the basic compiler for it. And that was in the time when I could actually still get photos of your program. Uh, but uh, this is where Microsoft started and they started from, from, from programming on an emulator. So maybe that's something that other people can pick up on as well. Uh, soon we will go to the real exercise on, on the notebooks uh, environment. But uh, Yami, was there some questions on the that has appeared. Uh, yeah, there should be a few. Yes. So let's let's take some questions first. Yep, I think this one is for you, Jan. Yeah, I can I can take this one. So, so in, indeed, it depends on the on the platform that you are building your quantum computer on. So, for example, I would say the most most popular one that also IQM is doing and Google is doing and IBM is doing is this superconducting circuit quantum computers. So there the all the signals are basically uh, microwave signals that you send to your qubits through these kind of transmission lines. And the qubits themselves are basically, you could think as a, the most, sim let's take a simplified picture, that you could think of them as, uh, uh, for example, like uh, superconducting coils where a superconducting current is running. And in some, some cases, this is not stri strictly true with I I IQM, but it's, uh, for example, D-Wave has it this way, that simply, the direction of the current depends the state of your qubit. So if, if your dar, dar, uh, current runs clockwise in the loop, then your qubit is in state one. And if it collides the other, uh, 
goes the other way, then you are in state of zero. And just by giving energy to this, uh, for example, yeah, just sending a, some energy to this system, you can kind of excite it to the, the more energetic state. And that's how you do a operation. So you send a microwave signal. And then actually in this case also just sending another signal, you can also flip it to the lower energy state. And uh, also just to briefly then, this is really similar with these trapped ions, but there instead of sending microwave pulses, you send laser light. And then your qubits will absorb this light and then they will excite and so on. Yes. Okay, can we use quantum computers to train deep learning networks? Uh, I would say in general, all uh, quantum computing is uh, very central to, to, to machine learning. And there's lots of efforts already being, being done, especially by Google AI on, on, on implementing parts of, of machine learning algorithms in, uh, with, with quantum computers. And um, so yes, th this is uh, one of the core areas of where quantum computers are thought to have an advantage. I don't know if Yami, you want to give a more specific yeah. answer, but mm, not really personally. I'm not yeah. looked into this one too much, but it's definitely one of the core fields. Yeah. Uh, now it's uh, you can choose if you want to uh, just follow or or if you want to do it in a hand uh, hands-on way. So, but um, if you want to do it yourself along with Yami, then point your browser to notebooks.csc.fi. And uh, what we are going to do is to run a quantum algorithm on, on the MyQLM uh, quantum computer simulator. Uh, and that's an open access version of the full uh, QLM that, that is, uh, th that one has more, more features and so forth, but just for demonstrating this works very well. Tell me if you get your screen share up. Yep. Let's see. Okay, you're seeing the right screen. Yes. Yep. Okay, so so the idea is to go through this kind of hello world type quantum program just to give you kind of an exposure on the way that these quantum programs are typically written. And uh, so we will do a super simple circuit that will con consist just of a single qubit and then we apply Hadamard gate on that and measure it and observe the results. And indeed often it is the case with this quantum programming language is that they are based on Python. And here we will be using this uh, MyQLM, uh, which is provided by Atos, and they also have their own library for quantum uh, computing uh, functions and all, which you can just import, and then you basically just code Python. And these are quite similar with all these other players also, like Google and IBM have their own languages which are quite similar to this. So it's once you know the logic, you can kind of quite easily run the rest of them also. So let's let's start um, by importing all the functions from this Kotlang Agasm library. With asterisk, we import, ev import everything. And then the, the logic of these quantum programs is quite similar always. So there's a few steps, especially in this MyQLM. And the first thing is to instantiate this kind of program object, which will be holding the instructions of our quantum program. So we just call this program function and give it some name. And then we want to allocate the qubits for this program, that how many qubits we are going to use in this program. We use qalloc method and give the number of qubits as an argument here and then some name for our qubits register, a bit qubits. So we run that. And then we apply the gates. So um, this is done with this apply method. And there is all the basic gates are inbuilt here on this library. So we can just give us a first argument, name of the gate, h for Hadamard. 
and the second argument will be the qubit which we apply it to. And now this this qubit is a it's a Python list, so we give it the first element here. Indexing starts from zero, so it's just the first first element of this list is the qubit we apply our gate to. And then we are done with our program. Next thing is to go on and convert this program object into another object called circuit. And this is kind of core object here in the MyQLM and QLM logic. And uh, for bigger programs, then you could, you could do all kinds of things with these circuit objects. You could optimize them. You could take them to be a part of a, a hybrid quantum classical alg algorithms and you could combine these guys. Uh, but we will just use use it here as kind of a necessary step in the in the logic. So we will use this to circ method on our program to get this circuit object. And one thing we can do with this guy is that we can use this cat display magics command and then the name of the circuit to print out and see how it how it looks. So indeed our super simple program has uh, one qubit and how the market applied to it. So here, like how you read this, this out is that time goes from left to right and okay, here is nothing much happening, but the one gate is applied and that's it. And then it's time to execute this circuit on a keep, uh, Q, uh, QPU, so quantum processing unit. And now, as you know, we are using a simulator. So this, this MyQLM, will be using linear algebra. So it will map the qubit into vector and the quantum gates as a matrix, and it will operate those to simulate the quantum comp computation. And this can be done for a small number of qubits because you can just, in your classical computer, you can store the, all the states of your quantum system. But if you have lots of qubits, the number of these possible states grows exponentially and somewhere around 50 it becomes impossible to store the state of your whole quantum register and at that point you cannot simulate quantum computers with classical computers anymore. Mm. So what we do is we we will now kind of to, to prepare the circuits to be submitted to a quantum processor, we will first uh, convert it into a job. And now there is two ways of doing this here, because first, as I told you, told you we are dealing with a simulator. So we can actually tell the QPU to keep the full information and uh, let us at the end of the calculation know exactly what the quantum state is. And that is done when we, we give no arguments here then it defaults to this situation where we'll, we will at the end get the full distribution of states and we will have access to the quantum amplitudes also. So that we can do here abusing the fact that we are actually just simulating a real quantum system. But then the second kind of more realistic way is that we specify here the number of measurements that we will do at the end of our uh, circuit execution. And in this way, we are emulating a real quantum computer. So now we tell the processor to measure the system five times number of shots at the end of the execution. Okay, we have now prepared these two different jobs. Then let's just import our quantum processor simulator from the library. It's by Linalg because it's based on linear algebra. There's also some other ways to do this, but this one is actually the most simplest and the exact way to, to model quantum mechanics. And uh, next up, we, we feed this or we submit these jobs to our QPU and read out the results into these, these objects here. Um, and finally, 
we can read out the results. So indeed, uh, we have two different results here. This first one is based on the, the full distribution where we, we have told the processor to keep, keep count of all the quantum states it's themselves and to let them know, let them, let us know them. So when we, when we, so, okay, sorry, let, let me tell you that this result is actually a list of samples where the samples are now the possible outcomes of our quantum measurement. So here we have one qubit, so uh, we can get either state one or zero. And then let's see, we'll ask for a probability amplitudes and probabilities of measuring these states. And indeed, when we print this out, we see that we have two possible states. They have the same probability amplitude, which you see is in general a complex number. And then they have 50-50, both have 50 uh, percent probability of being measured. And this is now, this probability is now exact in the sense that it's calculated using this famous Born rule, which states that the quantum, from quantum amplitude of some state, you can obtain the probability of measuring that state by taking the absolute square. So this is how we get these exact probabilities here. And now the second case was where we are emulating a real quantum processor and five measurements. So when we do the same thing, we print out our samples here. We see that first of all, there is no probability amplitude because the measurement destroys the quantum state. And the only thing that you can observe is that it's one of these basis states, superposition is gone. Mm. And you see that the probabilities are now based on statistical, um, statistical there are no statistical probabilities based on these five measurements. So here we have observed the state zero three times and the state one, two times. And as you can expect that if we increase the number of shots, this, um, uh, these probabilities will become more accurate and closer to the correct 50-50 distribution. Okay, and then so that was basically it, to show you that uh, what is the logic and the workflow of writing these kind of quantum programs. And even though this one was uh, super simple, simple stuff, it already still has important real world applications. And that is the generation of true random numbers. Because uh, random number generation is actually an important, important thing that has applications in many fields. For example, st statistical sampling that's important in, in science and engineering and stuff. And um, then cryptography is one important use case also. And then also more familiar gam gambling, gambling where you need to have random numbers so that no one can cheat. Uh, and yeah, and typically these random numbers are generated by some algorithm when they are kind of quasi-random or pseudo-random numbers. But indeed, there's the problem that uh, if someone knows the algorithm well enough and they have some information on the, the seed that was used to kind of generate this stuff, they can find patterns and some use some kind of bias to predict the outcome of your numbers. Uh, so a better idea would be to basically get your random numbers by looking at some random physical phenomena like uh, temperature or electromagnetic fluctuations. But here also, there could be some underlying patterns and, and stuff that could be abused with enough information. And this is where our quantum program enters the stage, because we have created a 50-50 superposition of our qubit, which is fundamentally unpredictable. So that when we measure this superposition, there is no way of knowing the outcome. And if we do this repeatedly, use it as a generator, then we can get, in theory, we can get true random numbers. So just quickly to 
uh, show this a bit more clearly, I can uh, give this extra argument here for when I define the job. So I tell the QPU not to kind of calculate these samples into into bins and keep count of the properties, but just print out all the all the things that it, they me it measures. And then indeed, uh, just to clear it up, uh, clean it up a bit, I can ask it to instead of giving me the get notation, give me some kind of nice bit string like this. So now if I would run this on a real quantum computer, I would actually be able to sample random bit strings like this. And then just just a note that for some of you, we noticed that it might be that this this guy here gives error, this underscore. So there's a workaround piece of code for that. So yeah, that would be the your hello world program. Thanks. Yes, we are nearing the end. This was, of course, a very quick, quick walkthrough. But the, but the notebook is available on the course homepage, so 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 you can download it from there. And and and. Uh, uh, but uh, let's jump back to the presentation. If I get to share my screen. Yes. So we are getting close to the end. The next steps would be for the interested to explore the other notebooks. Uh, it's always, I find it always easier to go through some example uh, by demonstration, but the, after that it is, uh, it, it's quite straightforward. There's lots of, of good notebooks uh, installed already in this uh, MyQLM environment, uh, and you can download that for yourself. And then there is naturally also other online hands-on resources that you can have a look at. So IBM Quantum, uh, Microsoft uh, has their own platform, Strange Webs has their own platforms. And uh, all of those are good in the way that they really have uh, also nice documentation and explain things very nicely for, for the beginner and, and also for the more advanced one. Uh, and uh, and then we can also read a book. And we have a few of our own recommendations here. So I think maybe, Yami, you give a few words about the first classic one. Yeah, the, this, this one by Julian Brown was the one I read first. And it's really nice because it's a, it's a really kind of a, non-technical and it, it goes through the history of quantum computing in a way. And it begins with this guy going to interview one of the pioneers of quantum computing or also this David Deutsch and then he's discussing with him and then he goes on and he meets meets many of these pioneering physicists and uh, the book also includes includes math and these quantum circuits but it's written in really uh, not too much and it's written in a way that non-mathematicians and everyone can understand it. It's really good, and it also goes on a bit of philosoph philosophizing, like in a in a nice way, but still completely legit stuff. Really interesting. Yes, now it's highly recommended, and and then I just uh, put up two books here that I've been using myself. I'm sure that there are uh, many others that are are good as well, but I've been uh, looking into this quantum computing and applied approach by Jack Hillary, and and then this. Uh, programming quantum computers and uh, that one also has a nice online uh, online asset where one can run the example programs uh, on an online server and uh, just recently came out this last one quantum computing for the quantum curious and that's an open access book uh, and uh, it's uh, starts from the basics and and uh, I think it uh, really nicely explains things. I haven't read it properly because it just came out, but but it seems like a good resource and that, that is uh, uh, a good free alternative to just go and browse. So just put that into, into Google and you will get to the Springer homepage where you can read the book uh, for free. Uh, but uh, yes, 
we are two minutes from the end and uh, I had fun preparing this and uh, I think Yami has always enjoyed this as well and, and, and we have been giving more extended courses with, with Yami before and, and then it's always a pleasure. Uh, I hope you learned something. If you have questions, then and then just keep keep them coming uh, after this after this webinar. But uh, as a final remark on this one, I would like to bring up Bio's uh, law on new technologies, which says that the near future is overestimated but the far future is underestimated. And I think this, uh, this has proven to be true for almost all technological advances and, and, and it probably will be true also for, for quantum computing. So, so, so we really have no clue where we will be in, in, in 20 years, but with regards to this and even less of a cube where we, uh, clue where we will be in 50 years. So, but uh, let's hope for a bright future for all of us. Thank you. Thank you.